series uh, with uh, Laia Pujo, who uh, has come all the way from Barcelona, University of Pompeo Fabra. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we practiced. <laughs> um, uh, to present to us, she spoke in uh, the uh, Cultural Heritage Management uh, class, uh, master's class earlier uh, today, so we had the, some of us in the room had the privilege of hearing her uh, her already on the topic of virtual museums, and now she is going to introduce us to some of her uh, current, literally up to the second, uh, research. Uh, Laia has worked for many years now uh, at the forefront of virtual reality as applied to archaeology uh, and uh, heritage. Long before other people were engaging with these issues, uh, Laia was there asking the critical questions and trying to set in, in place the frameworks for analysis and evaluation. And today, I think she is going to take us into some depth uh, related to her research on cultural presence uh, in archaeology. Uh, Laia is just finishing uh, her Marie Curie uh, fellowship uh, in Barcelona, and so we'll be able to hear how things have been going on that particular project called LEAP, and I'll let her define yes. what LEAP stands for. Okay. So thank you so much, Laia. Thank you, Sarah. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm overwhelmed by the massive assistance, so thank you very much to those who are here as well as to those who are following online. Um, thank God I don't see, so I won't be more stressed about it. And. Um, well, yes, actually, this what, what I'll talk about today is really the final stage, or the last, not the final, but the, the latest stage of uh, a life's career, actually, because uh, my whole life, let's say, I've been interested in the use of VR, virtual reality, in archaeology and finding better ways of using it for, for dissemination. And so, actually, this, as I said, is the latest stage of my research into that. So, has a lot of personal investment as well. And um, so with that, let me see if this works. Yeah, today we will start with, again, with a, a very simple question, okay? And I'll ask you um, to tell me, where are you now? Come on, to be sure. It's a very simple question. Where are you? <laughs> Oh, it's great to be honest. Let's meet Sarah, for example. Sarah, where are you? You are showing Sarah in uh, K159, the classroom. Okay. She has talked specifically about the space. What else? Any other possibilities? I'm in a very specific kind of social interaction, which is very far removed from what most people experience. That's very interesting. <laughs> you will see why. He's talking, she has talked about space and he's talking about the social dimension. Very, very relevant afterwards. Anyone else? Any other more philosophical, more ontological possibilities about this question? Okay, it's fine. Have you all watched uh, the Matrix movie? <laughs> okay, so remember that at some point, uh, Morphia, I think, talks to Neo, and he says, choose one of these two pills. You remember that scene? Yes. And if you choose one, uh, the blue one is, you, you will go back to where you were, but if you take the red one, you will realize you will remain in the real world, and you will see what, what happens. So, imagine that I say that all of this is a simulation, Okay, and I will ask you again, where are you? <laughs> Would your um, answer change now that you know that all oh, this is a simulation, a computer generated simulation, or you would say the same? Come on. 
Um, perhaps I am trapped electrical impulses. <laughs> That's not a possibility. He has a better perspective of it. Okay. I would say the same. <laughs> You're helping me today. <laughs> So you would establish layers of being in. Okay, okay. So it's all very relevant to what maybe you are wondering why, in which way. So we will see now in which way all this is relevant. Because it has to do with presence. Have you heard about this term before? Presence. Presence as research, the, the area of research presence, when it exists, and actually it is a very active one that uh, has been you know, there for, for many years. There is an international society, you cannot see really well, but anyway, there is an international society for presence research, um, ISPR. Um, I don't remember what, but you can look into it. <laughs> they have a journal, a very prestigious one, um, published by MIT. And they have um, an international, a yearly international conference. Now there is going to be in Japan, if I'm not wrong, in Tokyo, a pre-conference uh, dealing with, with presence as well. So all this is to say that it's a very active field of research. And you will be probably be wondering, okay, but what is it about? So we will talk a bit of about, about presence. Presence starts, sorry, stands at the confluence of these three areas of research. So on the one hand, human-computer interaction, computer graphics, and psychology. And we will do a bit of history very quickly, don't be scared, about that, so that you see that actually it is a very fluid or very, um, let's say, a term that has evolved a long time, from the 80s until very recently, even beyond that, you will see. And I would like maybe to, to start with, with this and mention this more specifically. Because actually, have you heard Marvin Minsky? He was considered the father of artificial intelligence and he died, he passed away um, less than a month ago. And he was a well-known person. And actually, he was also the father of, of presence through this concept of telepresence, which meant that you are, I am, for example, in this room, and through some devices, I am operating on something that is, for example, on the other building. So I am here, but I am acting as if I were there. And so there was all this evolution of the concept in which different researchers started. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> Definitely, this is a simulation. I cannot myself. So it works. The online feed, it works. The audio works. The audio, at least, yes. So, um, so you can see the different researchers added or enlarged or modified to some extent the term. Um, the most, the most well-known concept is this feeling of being there, okay? You are in this virtual world as if it really, as if it were real. And therefore, you compare the simulation with reality. Or some others who said, okay, for, in order for you to feel present in this real, in this virtual world, sorry, you should, the, the mediation should be invisible to you. You shouldn't see any device because in the real world we don't see any device okay the only device let's say is our body um some other researchers said yes but we have to distinguish between the capacity of the medium okay for example the capacity to simulate realistically and the world with our own subjective impressions okay it's different we should not measure what the device can do but our own feeling of it and then some others said, yes, but it's a matter also of attention. When you, where are you focusing your attention? Be it on this world or on, this, on the simulation, as we were saying before, or on the real world that we know that is out there. And some others said, yes, but you also should take into account that maybe different people have different capacities for presence. Okay, so maybe I may feel more presence, present or more presence than some of you in the audience who, who will say, well, doesn't make any difference to me. Okay, I understand that this is a simulation. Okay. To the extent that some people, again, now Slater, he is one of the, the most active researchers, said, what if, as a matter of fact, presence doesn't exist at all? 
he has a very well-known paper that um, the title of which is how colorful is your day and with that he was saying what if it's, what we are doing is when we ask users how present did you feel he never felt present but he tries to figure out what we might be meaning by with presence and then tries to figure out how to reply to that so actually what he said maybe presence doesn't exist at all we are just artificially creating this this con concept and finally as later again said but we have to distinguish also because still the body responds realistically to the uh, to this environment for example even if some people may not you know have the capacity or have less capacity to feel present there are some reactions that are still there and that we that we see in every person in every user for example when you see something coming you will move okay or you will try to avoid it and this is because you have top-down responses from your cognitive system let's say that when something enters your field of view unconsciously your body will react to that and this is every everywhere and this is always there be it the real world or the real the sorry the virtual environment so there is this need to distinguish between the, the two possibilities and questioners have been created at least three mostly by slater and winmer and singer to measure presence according to different factors which are those here so we have that presence is a composite okay feeling that depends on technical factors, what I was saying in the beginning. So the capacity of the technology to simulate accurately the world. And this involves immersion, visual realism, interaction, uh, intuitiveness, naturality of, of interaction. So this is for technical. Then we have cognitive as well, factors. So those that have to do with, with the person. Um, these top-down reactions that I mentioned before, when you avoid, um, the collision with for example with an object or the self-awareness because let's not forget that i feel also presence in this or present in this room because i can see my body and sometimes when you use um i don't know if you, you have done it um head mounted displays and you enter a, a virtual world sometimes you don't see your hands and it's very this is very strange because usually i do see my body so there is a need to feel the body um in this virtual world and finally, we have um, psychological factors that have, that have to do, as I said before, with they are a bit of, more or less the same or they are related with engagement, how engaged you, you feel um, by this, but what, what is happening, or attention, empathy. As I said before, um, the, the skills that people have or the predisposition that people have, for example, with imagination or um, suspension of disbelief. Do you know what is that? Yes, it's something that, that children have naturally. We just switch on and off, and we believe what is happening. So, for example, if I have a lot of suspension of disbelief, and whenever I enter a virtual world, I believe everything in there. Okay, so I feel <laughs> very much present, and also exposure. Um, some people have researched into the fact that if you are you use more and more a virtual world, you will get more present, or on the contrary, um, less. But even more than that, um, presence has gone through another revolution, okay? Uh, and this is what is really interesting for us. Okay? And it all started, and I will go very quickly through that, with Gibson's ecological theory of perception, okay? Which says that we are not passive receptors of reality, but we perceive things according to the affordances that it has for us and that we are, um, thanks to evolution, tuned, okay, to perceive them. So actually, we're, we are active perceivers of the world. If um, I don't know, or if, if I don't need a chair, I will not perceive this chair in front of me, okay? This is mostly what, what it means. And therefore, this implies a need for interaction. I need that my virtual world um, allows me to do that. This is very important. I take you back. Okay. If I cannot do that, it may hinder presence. But more than that, I may be someone who doesn't know what the glass is, okay, or what to do with it. So I may put it upside down, or 
and I am talking about that now because I have used them uh, glasses. It is in my cultural okay, framework. I will know that I have to do that. And the black. Okay. So what is happening here is that at some point, people said presence is more or virtual worlds are more than just perception. Okay. It is about interaction and it is about the cultural context that you need in order to have these affordances and for it to be meaningful. And this is when presence, the traditional concept of presence, was enlarged with three new concepts that are relevant for us. You will see where all this is going. Social presence, school presence, and cultural presence. <laughs> Let's talk then about cultural presence. <coughs> Very quickly, OK? Just to say that there has been an evolution, OK? That it has been enlarged. But it all started, as I said, with this cultural approach that two um, different Italian teams um, proposed as a, a better way to capture, to encapsulate what presence was about. And that mostly what, what they say is that um, we need, in order for everybody to culturally present, so you cannot be just present, you need to be culturally present. And for this, you need um, a, cult a shared cultural framework, okay, and negotiation or interaction. Okay, this is the important thing. Um, and you also need, for example, to distinguish between just a simple space or this feeling of place, which has a cultural meaning as well. And this also changes the way in which presence is evaluated. You don't just you know, measure bodily responses or uh, have objective questionnaires. You need to adopt a more qualitative analysis of it. It's negotiations you, you need, and it's subjective. So you need to ask people. Even um, they suggested the possibility to adopt discourse analysis to see what was happening when someone was inside this culturally meaningful world. Okay. And there have been researchers ever seen, you see, until very recently, from people who finally started taking seriously what cultural presence may contribute to the general um, um, area of presence research. And they found out that uh, people, for example, felt more present when um, virtual characters would give natural responses to them. Okay or the importance, as I said before, of place and how to create virtual environments that were not just spaces, but places, which is very, very difficult because they are in doubt with, with meaning. And then because games you know, came into, into the, the, the equation, um, several researchers started um, investigating what social realism means. And what are the elements in a game that make you actually feel present? Because you do feel present in a game. Or something that is also relevant for us is that, um, for example, and this has to do with role playing. And it is that when you adopt a body different than yours, this changes um, your perspective of different social sectors, for example. And this we are, and in here we are talking about um, social identity, which is also relevant for us. But you will ask, OK, this is all is very interesting, but why should we measure presence for different reasons? For example, for task performance, and this has to do with telepresence that I mentioned before, or training, and I put an image of a flight simulator, you need really to feel as if you were really in a cockpit, okay, or in the plane or uh, as an astronaut, um, in order for you to perform correctly. There are also therapies. The, have you heard about using virtual reality for, for as a psychological therapy, for example, uh, for um, spider fear of spiders or fear of heights? Naturally, I tried that and I was not sure. I can tell you, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but you do it, you know, as, as an exposure, step by step, until you you don't feel it anymore. Or for communication, okay. This is the, the most well co currently well known. Um, um, definition of telepresence, and it is when you manage to communicate with someone who is across the world as if this person were in the same room with you. Or for learning, and this again is relevant for us, and in this case I have underlined these three contributions um, by different authors who stress three things that again enlarge 
the concept of presence, which is the importance of context with, where you are applying it. So you, you will feel differently present depending on the context of application. Also, the need to expand the analytical scope of presence, again, apply it in different contexts so that the, the, the field is, is developed. And finally, this is very relevant to us, the importance of presence, of using presence to understand other cultures. So do you start to see where I am going with all this? OK. So let's go there. Let's talk about virtual archaeology, which is what this is finally all about, at least. <laughs> so um, tell me, what is virtual archaeology? <laughs> Come on, I, I, I have my opinion about it, but I want to hear yours. Don't be shy. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you feel when you hear about it? It's a very recent term, so it's fine if we have different opinions. Come on, voluntary. Someone who helped me down. An audiovisual experience is mediated through a screen. Here's what it used to be. Okay, so dissemination and interface we, we could emphasize here. Okay, but an experience. Okay. Looking at how our uh, um the relationship between analog and digital archaeological practice. Yes, because it has been. It ha has it changed, in your opinion? Uh, since it was, well, since the term was invented. Oh, you mean as practice? Yeah, has uh, yeah has the, the, the uh, digital not, has changed the practice in archaeology? It's traditional not practice. Much to be hmm. Okay, that's interesting. So we have dissemination. We have practice. Something else? It's pretty enough, I would say. It's a good summary of it. So it all started, let's say, officially at least, in 97, with this book published by uh, Mauricio Ford and, and Sigliotti. Um, and here you have the first time that the term appears, actually. And it also gives you, this is a good summary, because it gives you what was what has been more or less implicitly the goal of virtual archaeology, which is to, to travel to the past, to recreate ancient worlds. Okay, And this is what, what it meant. And you also have the means by which this is done, which is through virtual reconstructions. Okay, um, But actually, while well, the field has developed, and currently this considered is much more than just you know creating 3D models to, of of uh, architectures to show the past. It has diversified, okay, and we have different interfaces. So there is a diversification of technology, for example, and of practices that, that uh, they support. For example, the creation of, of 3D models, data acquisition, okay, with uh, laser scanning or photogrammetry. We also have augmented reality, so enhancing in real time um, our, our world using immersive devices to experience, again, uh, 3D models, or another version of, of, of immersivity, which is through cave-like installations. But also we have different goals, and this has to do with practice, which is, um, so virtual archaeology involves or spans across uh, excavation, and here I have put two examples that have to do with data acquisition or um, digital excavation. Some of you here have already used uh, that, I know. Um, or analysis, mostly to visualise um, sites or objects, but also for testing. And this were, was one of the latest um, examples of it by Bernie Fisher when he was at the University of Indiana, in which he was able to, to show that the traditional, let's say, hypothesis about how the uh, Augustus Arapachis was used was wrong. Actually, it, had, it didn't have to do with um, the, the shadow of the obelisk here, but with it being at the center, with having the, the sun at the center in the day of Augustus' birth. So, um, and for this, he used a simulation. Okay? He knew um, the position of the sun in this, this very uh, day. Um, so, so this is an example of, of using um, virtual reality in the context, not just of visualization, but of simulation. And of course, we have dissemination. And I chose, in this case, purposefully, 
not with two examples of virtual reconstructions, but to show that virtual archaeology also um, comprises more tangible interfaces, and I really hope that this is a development for the future. And in this, I have put uh, the example of two uh, outputs from two different EU-funded projects, ma major projects. In this case, uh, Vimost Vertex, um, which is in this it's a reconstruction of the Arapaches that is linked to a screen, or in this case, the loop in mesh project used as a mediator, okay, so this is a kind of augmented reality, um, to get more information on, on object and, um, and collections. So virtual archaeology, as an expanding field, it is establishing itself to the extent that it has conferences, but it also has guidelines. Have you heard about the London um, Charter? How many of you have heard about that? No? No? Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is the London Charter about cultural heritage, digital heritage in general. How many of you have heard about the Sevilla principles? <laughs> Okay, I see an expert over there, yes. <laughs> it's pretty sad. Not because of you, but, but for the principles themselves. <laughs> when I go back to Spain, I need to make a couple of phone calls. <laughs> because the, these principles have to do with have the application of the London Charter for virtual archaeology, okay. <clears throat> But unfortunately, and maybe this is one of the reasons why you have not heard about them, is because they are not followed. Um, so instead of that, we have empty, hyper-realistic reconstructions of architectures. And this um, is again, so contravenes four principles in the Sevilla um, principles, against okay, those of purpose, authenticity, transparency, mm -hmm. transparency and evaluation. So mostly what, what this is about is that we do not create virtual reconstructions of 3D models that have a clear purpose and that you use the, the tools that are needed. They are not transparent since we don't see the metadata that has been used or we don't see different hypotheses. And most of the time they are not evaluated. So we don't know if they are successful, if we have set the cl and clear goals and our goals are achieved and there is a reason for that okay and we have a confluence of two um, historical let's say um, paths or, or <laughs> developments one that is related to computer visualization because it mostly seeks that the main goal it aims for visual accuracy and entertainment okay on the other hand we have of course this archaeology itself that mostly, okay, I'm simplifying, I know, but it has traditionally uh, aimed at the description of finds. So the confluence of these two um, lines has currently has a result that currently will mostly produce uh, empty reconstructions. And why is that? And it is because they share, and here we are going back to philosophy, a dualistic concept of reality, okay, um, that comes from the Cartesian western concept of, of of the world that opposes um objective and subjective mind and body and in the case of archaeology description and interpretation so description is considered to be objective while interpretation is something subjective and this is why and because objects and people more than anything are considered subjective or are considered an interpretation they are considered not scientific so this is considered a very scientific okay um reconstruction of the past however there are um, exceptions to that okay um shall we try let's give let's give it a go let's <laughs> see if it works oh my goodness Okay, <laughs> that's right. I don't know if I'll be able to go back to the, to the previous, but we'll see. So this is one example of a project that uh, has been done in Australia by Anton Bogdanovic. This is Uruk, okay. And uh, what you have here are well, living things, mostly. And you will see different perspectives and people actually um, moving around and showing what life was at, at Rook uh, 3,000 years ago.
<laughs> okay, but at least it's an attempt, okay? You, you get what, what they want to do here, is to, to see people doing things, okay? Let me try to. Okay, so this is one example. There are others, okay? Um, there is, this is, for example, an example of a uh, Palenque project. This was a Champions PhD project. And in this case, he attempted um, an approach to the past in which the user would uh, would be active, okay, and there would be a social interaction with um, people from this culture, and this would be the way to, to learn about um, about uh, Palenque and the society. So all of these are examples of let's say more anthropological reconstructions that try to um, express or to understand cultural identities by means of interaction, role playing, or sense of place. And you should be, are you familiar already with this uh, concept since we talked, they, they were mentioned already in presence. And this is what I wanted to say. So actually what we are seeing is um, a, conf a convergence between cultural presence on the one hand and virtual archaeology uh, on the other, in which cultural presence may bring its methodologies that are very well established okay, of, of evaluation, of analysis, of assessment. And on the other hand, virtual archaeology that expands um, presence research into a new context that provides new goals. And this is where my research stands. Let's talk about FIP. That stands for um, Learning of Archaeology Through Presence. It is a two-year, unfortunately, coming to an end, project that I developed uh, at the Pompeu Fabra University of Barcelona. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary project uh, that is done at the humanities department with a team of archaeologists and at the um, ICT department that provide the technology and all the, um, the methodologies of, of evaluation. And the general aim is this, is to import this concept of cultural presence and expand it, adapt it to the needs of uh, um, virtual of archaeology um, in order to provide this theoretical framework for virtual reconstructions so that uh, they help better really re re depict and understand what the past was, um, but also to assess if really we are achieving our goals. So it has also a relationship with evaluation. And how is this done? So the project is developed in three phases. Um, the first, which is research, implementation and evaluation. So in research, mostly what we are doing, what I am doing, is this, through bibliographical search and a lot of thinking, um, mostly reading whatever is to be read about uh, the classical concept of presence, um, the theory of material culture, and um, seeing what defines archaeological cultures and through consultation also with um, the lead user group uh, to, to see what, how can we really frame and how can we define this uh, concept of cultural presence as a framework for virtual reconstructions. And the second thing is also how this can be implemented in, in a virtual reconstruction. And let me see if this works. Come on, oh. <laughs> oh, now I'm disappointed. Okay, it's a pity, uh, but it doesn't work. So mostly what, what I was showing you here is a video about the, the work that I was conducted la conducting last summer at Chitaliuk, and that showed the methodology used to, to actually do this, to define um, what cultural presence was, so what, what we came to call Chitaliuknes. And, and how this could be depicted in virtual environments. But it's okay. So the, the idea was to capture the essence of an archaeological concept, uh, sorry, of an archaeological um, culture, sorry, and see how this can be implemented into a, a virtual um, model that is meaningful for, for users. And this is, once this first phase was finished, this is what we did with the implementation phase. In this case, we build, we are building, this is actually what is happening now, um, a model of uh, Tsetaruyuk, the Neolithic site in Turkey, um, that mostly comprises five points of interest. These five points of interest arise from 
uh, the five defining elements of chatalo yurkesa culture. So this is the, the knowledge or the, the, what encapsulates the culture that we want to convey. And um, we have also five versions of this model, one empty, one with objects, another one in which, in which you, uh, people are introduced, but they, they are still, another one in which you have scenes happening in front of you, and another one with, we will see what happens, we have to take a decision on that, either text at hotspots or a narrator talking, or different narrator talking, which then um, includes uh, the notion of empathy. Okay, so it's, it's very, it's a bit different. But why are we doing that? And this for the sake of evaluation. So um, what we have done or, is to create or to, to establish an operational definition of cultural presence, because up to now I have not yet said that what is then cultural presence for us. And cultural presence in this case is a term okay, for evaluating the subjective experience of feeling that one understands or is aware of or appreciative of or learning more about um, a past belief system. So in this case, in comparison with the traditional notion of presence, presence is not a goal. It is at the same time a means for and a measure. So presence is the way um, in which we achieve or the way that will allow us to um, um, to achieve better learning, actually. So not going to that. <clears throat> there are different ways of developing okay, this, this um, evaluation. There is a complex one, which is the thing here that I won't talk about. But what we decided in the end is since, nevertheless, there has been no systematic evaluation of current virtual models, we prefer to concentrate on what we are learning now with uh, virtual reality, with, with virtual reconstructions. So, and this is why we created these five different versions that mostly cover the different kinds of 3D models that we have out there. But, and what we will try to do is to compare learning and engagement and understanding across, across this, these different uh, versions. So the idea, the general idea is that we would like to see if when we go through these different versions, so from empty to fully populated, okay, we learn more and more. We should see in parallel that from empty to fully um, populated and interactive, we feel more and more present and then be able to correlate both. Because if this is the case, then the logical conclusion is that the more present we feel, the more culturally present we feel, the more we learn. Okay, so presence can be used as a measure and as a means to enhance learning with virtual reconstructions. Is this clear? Yes? Have I convinced you? <laughs> okay. But <laughs> if I have convinced you, now I will raise okay, uh, the issues about that. In which way? There are problems, let's say, or there are issues, issues at three levels. Okay. First of them, um, do you want, can you see, okay, let's, let's stop here. Can you see any problem with what I have set up to now before I really go into it and I throw stones at my own? <laughs> <laughs> Please, go ahead. My, my problem is that you seem to think, you seem to have the principle that healing will lead to learning to understand it. Um, mm. it's a idea that I don't yes. Well, it's not exactly that. It's, yeah, because I've been using the, the term feeling that you feel present, but you you could say just being present, but you have to assess it in, a, in some way. So the way to assess presence is by measuring body response or by actually asking the user how he's feeling, but not in an emotional way, also in an emotional way, but, you know, being able to assess his state of mind and body and, and awareness, actually. Okay. So it's not that much emotional as a way of assessing how you are, yes, feeling at, at the moment. What, what's your ap appreciation, subjective appreciation of your state of mind and of body in this, in this environment, okay? But also there is this empathic um, 
layer that needs to be added. So mostly it is about not saying that the more you feel, the more you learn, but the more present you think you are, or you can show, or, or we can assess that you are, the more you should be learning. Yes, yes. Actually, you, we will talk about this now. We will, we will raise this now. Yeah, yes. Any, any other comment about that? Any other problem you see? Uh, the idea that if you've got religion, in inverted commas, you're not in a position to study it. So it follows on from Steve's point. I've been lucky enough to be with ritual specialists, Bushmen, Shamans, whatever you want to call them, in the Kalahari Desert. And when they go into the altered states, um, they honestly believe that they're there in the spirit world, bringing down gain the rain and so on. So I'm there. And if I was fully immersed in that, I don't think I would be able to learn as much about it because of that subjectivity. Yes, that's a good one as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes. Anything else? I will write all of them now. Pity that they are towards the end of the project. I will need one more year. But, uh, yeah. yeah, look. Oh, some I'll say It depends part on what you mean by learn as well. Uh, there's a whole raft of literature on how you define learning. Yes. Is it knowledge? Is it understanding? Is it skills? Is it changing perception? Yeah. Changing behaviours? You know, there's a whole there are whole <coughs> documents about what people are supposed mm -hmm. to learn in museum situations. Then you've got the problem that you're assuming learners want to learn. Learners actually may be resistant to what you're trying to teach them. So, so you, there's a two-way flow here, not just the one-way flow from from you know, the cultural presence to the learners. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of potential problems. Okay, so let's summarize all this, starting with, again, cultural presence. And first of it, we have already mentioned that, is that at, with cultural significance, cultural presence may not be universal. For example, I put this example here, if we don't know anything about uh, the, the tea ceremony, we may be seeing that and really not be appreciative of that. We don't understand what is happening, okay? So we need, we need help with that because we don't share the culture about learning. It's a very complex concept, as Don said. And so we need to define actually what we mean by learning. Okay, so I guess this is, you need to position yourself in this case. This is the, the notion of learning that I will adopt. Um, and then how to support and how to evaluate it without hindering presence. Why? And this, for this, I can tell you, I don't have the answers yet because we have not started the third phase, which is evaluation. So maybe if there is a possibility for an next seminar, then I will be able to provide all the results. But for example, in this case, I have put this as an example that one thing is, so, so we have a conflict here, let's say, between simulation and augmentation. What do I mean by that? And it is what I said. I may you know, be standing and watching this tea thing happening in front of me and not understand a thing. And what I will need probably some verbal some augmentation, some text, some explanation that tells me what is that I am seeing, because on my own I'm not able to understand. But if I have this added layer of, of symbolic, let's say, information, will this um, prevent me from being present? Will I feel, will I, will I understand that this is a simulation, this is a fake environment? I don't have yet answers for that, but this is a thing that needs to be taken into account. Because then the correlation between presence and learning is, is broken. But we also have issues in archaeology itself, and this has been mentioned before. For example, about archaeological on, and on, um, uncertainty. Um, if we are to um, implement the civilian principles, um, it means that we have to show different um, hypotheses and a whole bunch of, of metadata, a lot of things. So it means that if I show different hypotheses, Will I still feel present? I will not have a, a full reconstruction in front of me. I will understand, you know, that this is a fake thing or, or this is a, um, a more intellectual approach, let's say, or an expert thing. Or we have the ethnographic bias because, um, as it was already said many years ago, um, we, from a Western perspective, how can we reproduce properly what another culture experiences and enter and, and reproduce actually the whole symbolic and, and belief system. So if it is hard for us to do it in the present, imagine what it is to do it for a culture that disappeared thousands of years ago and for which we don't have any you know, 
testimony or we don't have a written word so so and we only use we infer it from material culture we will nevertheless be biased about that and as i said at the beginning how to implement again the civility principles without hindering presence um hold up. Uh, yeah, well, okay, so let, let me go on. And maybe the solution, so, um, um, is in the there and then, of the being there and then, as a definition of presence. Let's start by, with the then. And we will now deal with the issue of the bias that I was just mentioning. And here in this table, you, what you have is a summary of reconstructions done within, um, and I, I know that I have put it in a very simple way, okay, in three very big schools of archaeological uh, thinking, thought, which is cultural history, processualism, and critical theory. We won't go into that, but what I want you to, um, what I want to convey is the idea that um, different schools in archaeology of thought have used virtual reconstructions in different ways okay there are different concepts behind in the case of processualism and cultural history as i said before um, um 3d models are believed to be um represent or should be a model for objectivity and scientific truth they believe that this exists okay that the science can be objective and that what we aim for is scientific truth on the other hand we have the different critical um, theories that say in any case any science and especially archaeology is an interpretation so they are much comfortable with this ambiguity and with accepting the contribution of of the researcher so with this we can already implement a more or we can go for we can aim for a more phenomenological phenomenological reconstruction of the past as has been proposed for example by Ruth Trinkham or by Yanis Hamilakis more recently, what they say is, since nevertheless, we already know this is a, an interpretation, we will never be able to know what the past was like, because it's um, ontological, or it's epistemologically impossible, why not um, try for a more multi-sensory approach that does not try to simulate really what the past was like, but putting emphasis on other aspects on what it was and with this i'm quoting someone from from here for the audience who said what it is like to be us there back then okay so we we move the visual uh, realism that we move the emphasis sorry from visual realism to other things that are so this is what we have now okay mostly we aim in virtual reconstruction to create for visual realism but what we propose with that is to move to multi-sensory um, um, reconstruction, so synesthesia, interaction, emotional and intellectual immersion, immersion. So what we already do in games, what we have in games, which is an overall sensation of very similitude. And it's actually supported by presence, okay? And I will really go very quickly to it. Just to say that traditionally, presence was based, as I said before, in this Cartesian notion of reality, um, and this comes from philosophy itself, that says, as I said, that there is a truth out there, but then nevertheless we will, ne we will never be able to reach it. And this is what, remember, the very first slides I mentioned, well, he was there, Tom Sheridan, who says we should measure presence by how close our virtual world is to the real world. And so they, they consider that presence is an ontological problem. It is about how reality is. Well, this is not true because presence is not really about how reality is because this is out of our reach, but it is about how we understand it and how we analyze it. So it has to do with epistemology. And very quickly, don't worry, we will not get into um, philosophical um, aspects now. But the idea is to say that resurgence in presence all are supporting this more um, interpretive um, version of, of, of understanding of the virtual world based on three, um, yes, three philosophers, three, three researchers. Gibson is not really a philosopher. 
who already say this, come on, it's not an ontological problem, okay? Nevertheless, we never, we don't think, we act, okay, in the world. So um, it is not about really thinking about, about it, but about the affordances that is allowed and how to interact with the world. It is through interaction that we really perceive the world. What are the implications of that? It is that in any case, we are present in all worlds. Remember my first question in the beginning with the two pills and everything. Uh, no matter if, and I asked, would you change your, your opinion now? <laughs> Even if we are, also, we can be in the real world or in a virtual world, we will feel present there because our body is already in there. So, and we have these top-down responses. So nevertheless, asking in real, by comparing with the real world is useless, let's say. The important thing is interaction, is the, the, how you enhance this virtual world, the affordances that you put in there for whatever it is, training, task performance, um, learning, or whatever it is. Not visual realism, which is what we are now concentrating mostly in, in virtual archaeology. But actually, in the end, it goes back, it is the original concept of presence, that, of presence, that understood presence not as a, as a goal, but as a tool in itself. And with regard to the, to the there, what about, how can we overcome what we were saying before, this, this, what is learning, how to define it, and, and how to do it without hindering presence. So how can we learn through presence? Well, when you learn in real cultures, what do you do? You need time, okay? And you do mostly three things, which is, and I mean, this mostly Eric Champion has talked about it. You observe, you stay, stand there and observe what is happening around you. Imagine yourselves when you go live somewhere else or when you visit you know, a foreign country, what do you do? If you go there and observe, you will stand and not intervene. But if you stay for longer, you may emulate as well. Or when you were kids, how do you learn your own culture? You emulate what you will see from your parents, from people around you in school. You will interact as well with this world, with this culture. And with this, you learn about this culture, OK? And it is done through a combination of sensory input and output that is more iconic or more symbolic, OK? We have texts, books that tell us about, or we have just observe what is around us. So the same should be done in virtual environments. But of course, implementing all this here requires time to skills, which usually translates into budget. And what you need to build is a very complex environment allowing free navigation, social presence, interaction, storytelling. And there is a researcher that truly believes that um, virtual environments are made mostly for learning, and it is through presence that you achieve that. But more than that, and this is a rise and a rising field at the moment, all this can be achieved through gaming, through this framework, which contains all of it. And this is what games aim for. And they are possible because they are there, and we see that they are being built. Okay, so and in this case, I would recommend you to read Eric Champion um, because he is really the one theorizing um, the use of games in uh, virtual habitat or in habitat. But this is out of scope, because okay? this would be for leap to, okay? In this case, what we will do is to evaluate the current, as I said before, the current state of the art of archaeological virtual reconstruction because this is missing, okay? We really don't know what is the effect that virtual reconstructions are currently having. We don't know what we learn. Some evaluations have been done, and we have seen that there is some superficial, spatial learning, but we really don't know what is happening, because strangely, it is taken for granted. And finally, how to comply with the civic principles. Again, I don't have any clear answer for you yet, because the evaluation has to be done. <laughs> But one thing is clear is that there are already, as I said before, some evaluations that show that um, you really, so that realism is not really paramount, it's not important for, for users, for audiences. They are very willing to suspend this belief, maybe, we don't know, but or they are so amazed still by technology and by the possibility of seeing these reconstructions that they say, 
really we do not care or sometimes they uh, this is uh, bracken they they are watching a reconstruction in a screen this size and they will say no no we feel really present we were there we were traveling to the past so if audiences don't care the thing then is that we researchers maybe are obsessing too much with realism okay and we should look into something else that probably will would make our life easier <laughs> <laughs> so when it comes if we are to define um or if we had initially defined presence as being there and then maybe the solution here is to create virtual environments that are better than being there and then what do i mean by that we should not aim at just simulating reality which is the traditional concept of presence but at enhancing our own simulations of reality so we should create um, virtual models and this Sarah said something when she was interviewed in Chatalo Europe which is really to augment to create perspectives that you could not have in reality and this is the, the advantage of virtuality that you can do things that you could not do in the physical world okay take different perspectives include information that you would not see in real time include storytelling allow for personalization which would really go beyond simulation which means that we should think of virtual reality or virtual environments as a playground, okay? And cultural presence in this context would aim at making the rational experiential, okay? And with this, we have a whole bunch of areas of research that can help us, that are visualization we already know, but role playing, for example, in games, what I said before, and also embodied interaction. Okay, which is another field of research that comes from human computer interaction. And I think <laughs> it was enough, wasn't it? <laughs> How present do you feel now? <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sure there are questions uh, for Lyra, and we have time for a few. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I'll start at the very back with Gareth. <laughs> um, this is quite a short question, but I was wondering um, what you mean by virtual reality. And the reason I asked that question is because one of the things that's happened a lot in archaeology is we talk about virtual reality like it's completely unproblematic concepts. Wow, wow. Some of uh, that's a revenge. Did you, those who were this morning in the lecture, did you go talk to him and say, ask her the same question that she asked us? At least one of them did, but it's a coincidence. Okay, because this morning I, I put them in a you know embarrassing situation because I asked them what was the reality. So, anyway, yeah. In, hmm. I, at that moment of my life, okay, in my career, I do believe that virtual reality should define immersive, interactive environments. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, most, yes, I think this, this would be the, the, the most synthetic um, response that I could give to that. Is it satisfying? Yeah, yeah, I was just, I wasn't, sorry, I wasn't trying to trick you, I was just wondering what, <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering what exactly was you were looking at, so if you did looking at sort of um, uh, head-mounted displays. And yes, like that. Right, yeah. Okay. yeah, actually, yeah, um, we experimented with two possibilities for the implementation, which is, um, which were a cave-like system, okay. but it had a problem with the size of the screen, so it was not immersive enough. And then we really didn't want, we wanted to minimize this traction from the outside world. So minimize, minimize factors that have already been researched into in presence research and concentrate and, and have the most immersive experience possible so that we wouldn't have to look into the factors related to the, uh, to the device. 
Okay, so to the technology, if you remember the first uh, list of factors, the diagram of factors that I gave. So we wanted really not to have to deal with, with um, technological factors. And for this, the, the definition of virtual reality that we are adopting is immersive interactive um, in synthetic environment. So that would be the, the definition. There are so many crossovers and resonances with the work I'm doing currently. But what I'm doing is I'm looking at missionary narrative theory and how that applies to how we communicate art and archaeology. And it just struck me that everything you said there applies not just to virtual reality worlds. It applies in the analog world as well. And I've just been currently looking at museum displays and taking those apart from the narrative perspective. And I'm coming up with exactly the same issues and problems that you've been, you've been describing from a totally different theoretical perspective. One, the one thing I would say is that while I agree with you about the realism thing, I'd be wary about how we define realism. Mm -hmm. In missionary narrative, realism doesn't mean verisimilitude. Realism can be a world which is real to the viewer, but which isn't, which isn't actually realistic. There's a difference. And so what we mean by realism is, is, a, is a problem. It's what the narrative theory is called mimesis. Mm -hmm. And there's something else which, uh, which comes into the narrative theory, which is, which is thematic resonance. Yeah. The viewer or the reader or the person who is wearing the goggles brings with them something to the experience. Um, and how that, what they bring with them resonates or not with what they're seeing largely governs how they interact with it. I think that's the really hard thing to include in your model. And I think that's the thing that could shoot you up in terms of trying to evaluate it. Yes, th thank you very much. Sorry. No, 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 not at all. I think that the, what we should do is... is well, just, I just have to put it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to drink because... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 definitely. Jamie. <laughs> It follows on a bit from that. I, I love what you said as well about the interaction and the immersing and the embodiment and the play. And my earlier point about um, indigenous groups, if you like, which is probably predictable for those in this room that know me, is how much we can learn from, from these ontologies because that's exactly what most of these groups will talk about. And that's how they would define whether something's real or not. So the Thunderbird is, is very real to yeah. Native American groups. But it, it, I was interested in terms of your talk, when you talked about the ethnographic approach, whether or not there's a bias, you know, there's a different issue. Because it also ties in with the idea of, of how people might define presence. And the idea of a, um, a, a universal, it has to be culturally mediated. And yet we do know that every human, and this is a bold statement, has always, all groups have to find a way of breaking up the spectrum of human consciousness in one way or another whether we talk about someone being rational, irrational, drunk or sober. And of course, it's different in different cultures, but there is a need to make sense of that. And I think that ties in exactly. So for a long rambling start, the question would be, what, what do you think we can learn from, from the ethnography? So, uh, ask the person next. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> what can we learn from, you talked about the ethnographic development for the last 10 years. What about the the earlier ethnography from you know as long ago as a hundred years ago and how people conceive of presence? Wow, yes, I'm not sure if I can answer to that. I'm trying you now to to browse quickly through presence uh, bibliography about that and how they have included um, ethnographic research into that. And I would say that in present research, they are using the term not meaning that that they, there is ethnographic research, but you, you know, in a more broader sense of the term, by saying that that we need to, to talk about other cultures. But um, in those examples that I gave, where I showed when I showed you the video um, about Uruk, in these cases, what they have done, and um, in other examples that I didn't show here. What they did, actually in Australia again, and this is important, is that they went and they talked to the um, to the communities and tried to and sat down with them and created these virtual worlds together with them to see what was relevant for them and how this could be implemented into a, into a virtual reconstruction or into a virtual world full of actually and what was interesting in this case that I am thinking of, I can try to look for the for the reference and give it and give it to you. Um, is that what they found out is that for most of these people, 
um, visualization was not important, which is the primary aspect in virtual reconstruction. For them, it was about sounds mostly, and um, about really being able really to. Go. It had to do as well with storytelling and about continuity, and they had a problem in how to really um, create reconstructions that that, that would really um, encapsulate to some extent this this continuity of the world and this lack of, of um, separation between the self and the surroundings. And this leads me to say something that, that, is, uh, that may add to what you were saying, even if I'm not completely answering to, to what you asked, but it is that deep down, and this is a, is a general statement, okay, what I would like you to understand is that we believe, again, that virtual reconstructions are neutral, okay, that they are objective and they are not, okay. They have a whole philosophy behind it that stands from the fact that the computer is there, okay. We are creating simulations with a computer and a computer stands or, or is the result of a mathematical research that, as I said, comes from a philosophy, a very specific one, that is Cartesianism, okay. And so we should never think that this is a tool that is totally objective but it has a very particular way of representing the world, okay? So when we say, yes, virtual reality is objective because it simulates the way we understand, oh no, 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 sorry, the way the world is, as I said, it's not a matter of ontology, it's a matter of epistemology, okay? It's how we think the world is. And more than that, we represent it and we analyze it. And second thing we say, it represents the way we see the world. No, again, it's not, um, it doesn't mimic the way we perceive the world, okay? It's embedded in the Western tradition of representation of reality. So, again, what I intend to say by that is that if you are to use a virtual reconstruction, be aware of what you can do with that and the implications that, that you know, the deep implication that, that, that this has for your representation of the world and understand that this is another tool for interpretation. Colleen. Paul Riley coined virtual archaeology in 1991. Um, but, uh, and I've written about telepresence in archaeology. Um, and I think that um, I find presence a bit limiting. And um, I think embodiment, um, embodiment is a much more productive and heavily supported <coughs> concept, especially in, in anthropology. And I think you could actually move away from sort of the Heidegger um, references move farther into like Donna Haraway and Catherine Hales, Elizabeth Roche, who have all productively written about embodiment, including constructing a body as a multiple, that I think is actually quite, um, would help a lot more because obviously Rudy Rucker pointing to health presence uh, as where you are when you're talking on the phone, which is kind of interesting yes. um, because I like to think about that um, as the way we can understand archaeology. You know, you're not quite here, you're not quite in the past, but you're somewhere sort of in between. But that also implies that the that you cannot um, project a multiple of your subjectivity into that virtual archaeology. So I think um, you might find it a bit, I don't know, I know it's, it's your whole your whole project no, is no. about presence, but I think that that is a very um, relevant and very interesting area of, of research you might look into. Okay, let me say something. Okay, just stop that. I don't want it to go um, <laughs> live I cannot, but I'm going to make a confession here. <laughs> stop and broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow I will be mine if I ever said that. Okay. Good night, folks. <laughs> <laughs>